Tim. Father, we pray for Tim now as he comes and shares in God's word. We thank you for what you have laid on his heart. We thank you for the time that he is put into preparation. And we ask that you would speak through him now. Amen. Amen. I'm not leaving. Um, before I, I, I just talk, can I just mention about the uh, the new sheet? Obviously, look after it because it's going to have to last you the summer. And can I just, particularly on behalf of the leadership team, just mention this prayer challenge. Obviously we have been praying and I know a lot of people have been praying privately as well as on the different times that we um, <coughs> have been together to pray about the future of the church and listening for God about what the future holds and whether we should do various things, whether we should call a pastor or whatever. Um, but we, we have put some extra dates in um, and we are praying this evening as we would do, so we will continue with that during the summer holidays, we feel that's important if you are available. And um, we'll be meeting here in the church this evening at 6.30. And also, um, we want to make Tuesdays a particular prayer focus. So in your individual prayers, um, please perhaps just focus particularly on praying. It doesn't matter what time you pray. Now, if Tuesday's a bad day for you, <laughs> you know, obviously God's not fixed by time. But perhaps for us, we do need to perhaps have reminders and little markers in our diaries. So if you can just encourage you just to pray and to listen uh, for what God's saying to us. Obviously, we had that day of prayer and discussion a few weeks ago in June. And this came out of that. So let's just continue to pray. I'm sure God's got something really special for us. So and we need just to be united in hearing what God has got to say to us. So anyway, make sure you get your weekly news. Um, apparently there's a, there's a little time, a little spelling, it's not a spelling mistake, it's a wrong name. Next week it's Mr. Easton coming, is that right? I didn't catch his first name. David Easton is coming next Sunday to speak. So that's on the 31st. So not Colin, so... Colin can have a rest. <laughs> anyway, lots of dates coming up, so make sure you've got those in your diaries. We, I know so September seems a long way away, but uh, it will creep on and up on us very quickly. Uh, and also, congratulations, I was looking through Joy's diary the other day, I don't often do that. <laughs> and she keeps a record of people's anniversaries and birthdays, and I know that last week and this week, lots of you have been celebrating anniversaries. It was all kind of in there, lots of you. Who's got an anniversary like this week or last week? Last week. Last week, gotcha. And a big birthday over there, Ted, wasn't it? They're all big. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Mum and Dad have got a big, a, a, a big wedding anniversary this week as well. Uh, it's not a big round number, but it's still a big date in their diary as well. So lots of people. Anybody else have a special anniversary? Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Maria and Alan as well, I think they had an anniversary. There were lots of people in the fellowship celebrating in the last week, so congratulations. Okay, is the PowerPoint... You should just click, right click, it should move it on. And again. There we go, that's it. Whilst we've been away in the caravan this year, I've been rereading my favourite book, and I know I've mentioned it before, The Shack. Um, and it's written by this chap called Paul Young. But on one of our rallies when we were away, we were encouraged to share a book that's really helped us. Now, obviously, this book is fictitious, but it's a story. And I believe it's probably helped me the most to understand some of the heart of God as the Trinity, um, his desire for relationship, really his love for me and other people, and a little bit a bit understanding about how God allows suffering. And obviously that's a big, big issue in this book. Now one section in this book recently grabbed my attention where Mac, and that's the man at the centre of the story, who suffered abuse from his father as a child, and the kidnapping and murder of his youngest daughter, is confronted by meeting God 
as the Trinity. He meets Papa, that's who he calls Father God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And they meet in a shack where these three parts of the Godhead live. And although whether, whether it's, a, it's a dream kind of sequence, but he goes through a real journey of discovery, healing, restoration, and, and building a new trust and relationship with his God. And I want to share a small section this morning with you where Mac is trying to understand what a relationship with God really means. Mac said, don't you want us to set priorities? You know, God, then whatever, followed by whatever. The trouble with living by priorities, the Holy Spirit responded, is that it sees everything as a hierarchy, a pyramid. If you put God at the top, what does that mean? And how much is enough? How much time do you give me before you can go on with the rest of your day? The part that really interests you so much more. Papa interrupted, you see, I don't just want a piece of you or a piece of your life. Even if you are able, which you are not, to give me the biggest part, that is not what I want. I want all of you and all of every part of you in your day. Jesus now spoke. I don't want to be the first amongst a list of values. I want to be at the centre of everything. When I live in you, then together we can live through everything that happens to you. Rather than a pyramid, I want to be the centre of a mobile, where everything in your life, your friends, your family, occupation, thoughts and activities is connected to me but moves with the wind in and out, back and forth, in an incredible dance of being. And I, concluded the Holy Spirit, I am the wind. The lovely thoughts there about not wanting just a part, not even the biggest part, not even the top part, but he wants everything. And I think for me, you know, as growing up, sometimes it's been very easy to think, well, you give God his bit and then everything's all right. But perhaps I want us to think this morning that, that we need to be thinking that Jesus needs to be at the centre. I love that kind of picture of the mobile, our lives being a mobile, all of, you know, all the bits of our life kind of going around us. Sometimes it's a bit chaotic. But the Holy Spirit blowing through it in every part, bringing everything together. So I want to spend a few minutes thinking about a few characters in the Bible who had the opportunity to meet with God and how they reacted to allowing God to be at the centre of their being in their life. I suppose the right place to start, or sorry, I should just put, that sometimes the kind of picture we have. I, I couldn't get a really good picture of a kind of a Christian mobile, but <laughs> you get the idea of all the different bits kind of hanging off of our lives, all kind of going round and round us, and Jesus being part of it, rather than this kind of pyramid kind of effect where we try and balance out what is important yeah, in our lives. Because sometimes it gets as you get all these kind of um, contradictions, you get all these conflicts. But when Jesus is and God is at the centre of everything, then it's much better. This so morning I was thinking about the first bit. What does God want? Well, of course, we read about that in the uh, Ten Commandments and in, in Exodus 20. We read these words, you shall have no other gods before me. And in, yeah, here, so then he, Moses tells the people about these things. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. 
And that is not easy. That's all that's impossible, isn't it? It's an impossible target. <coughs> because, of course, with our sin, we so often fail and short, we fall short of that. And, of course, when, when we trust in Jesus, there can be restoration. But even though we can have a restored relationship, we still fail and we still, that relationship sometimes is distant. So we have choices to make about what our God is going to be. And of course God did not make us to be robots. He did want us to have a relationship with him. And we're not just here to follow orders. In a sense that would be much easier if we were just pre-programmed just to follow orders. <coughs> but he's designed us in his own image and he gave us free will. And so we have the opportunity to make our own decisions and our own choices. Of course, there's that relationship with Jesus that restores these things. And of course, God desperately wants us to have a restored relationship. And that's why he sent Jesus. Of course, to have a good relationship, you need to have two people who want to have that relationship and for it to, flush, to flourish. Of course, in this case with God, it God and us. And God has already reached out to us. And I suppose the question is, are we willing to interact with him? Or are we just going to ignore him? So I just want to think for a few moments about some of the people who met Jesus and who reacted to Jesus in different ways. The first one is the rich young ruler. And of course that's recorded for us in Matthew 19. And for this young man at first, everything seems to be going well. I think his question is genuine. He's not out to trick <coughs> Jesus. And he's really trying to seek God. He's, he's trying to live under God's rules. But of course he's going to fail. And Jesus takes him to the central issue, which is his wealth, which is his God. He was unwilling to let go of it. And interesting, when Jesus in that little section there lists out some of the commandments, the young man claims to follow them, but Jesus does not actually mention the first commandment, not to have any other gods before me. But that was the one, the young man, and so often ourselves, possibly could not follow. He just couldn't, he couldn't accept that one because he was rich. And I suppose for all of us, it is hard to put God in that first place. And of course, really, he went away sad. Sad in spirit and soul, because he wanted to hold on to what he had. And he didn't want to put God first in that way. Of course, in contrast, we have this young, sorry, we have the poor widow, who we read about in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. And this poor widow has nothing but these two small copper coins, but she's willing to give it all. And of course Jesus is watching her with his disciples and he mentions it to the disciples that although she's given everything, she's held nothing back. I don't know what she was planning to live on, but she did what, what, was, what was expected of her and she gave that small gift but it was all that she had and it's not the size of it but it's the heart expression of what was in her mind and in her heart and because we don't know what happened to that lady afterwards um, whether i can't imagine this maybe it's not recorded and this is i'm kind of making this up but in a sense i can't imagine jesus seeing that and then letting her go home with nothing um, I don't know. There's lots of questions in the Bible. Do you have that where you think, I wonder what happened next? Um, I can imagine Jesus, whenever Jesus sees people who are struggling, he always wants to help. And I, I don't know, in this case, many others on that day had given in greater gifts. They were greater in financial terms, but they were less in spiritual terms. But this poor woman had given so much that day because she loved her God. And of course, God always gives us more than we can give him. I just wonder if we're holding anything back, or are we willing to give the last bit of ourselves to Jesus this morning?
And there's this lovely story about the Roman jailer in Acts 16. Of course, Paul and Silas are nursing their wounds from a recent beating. They're singing praises to God in the middle of the night when this earthquake potentially releases them. And the poor old Roman jailer is so worried about failing in his duty if the prisoners were to escape. He almost kills himself on the spot to save a worse fate later. Being a Roman jailer must have been a bit of a miserable, dark existence with the expectation of violence and dealing with the hopelessness and despair of the prisoners he was kind of looking after on a daily basis. Not a very positive life. But Paul steps into this situation and assures him that everything is going to be all right. And this man responds by wanting to become a believer by asking those amazing words, what must I do to be saved? This man's situation is transformed when he accepts the message and is baptised. And of course, in that, in that action, he is changed from being that ruthless, maybe even cruel Roman jailer to someone who opens his home so his family can meet the prisoners. He washes them and he cares for them treats their wounds and gives them a meal. When he accepts Jesus, his previous dread is turned to total ecstasy and he is filled with joy. This jailer does not know much Bible knowledge or much about Jesus, but he's willing to open his life because he believes. I wonder if he heard Paul and Silas singing praises to God earlier before he went to bed. We don't know. But I wonder if he thought they had something special. We don't know if any of the other prisoners who were kept awake by the singing responded in faith. We don't know these things. But we do know that this man's life was turned around. I wonder what the, what the jailer did after this experience. I wonder if he left his job as a jailer and, I don't know, went into a career of doing something completely different. <laughs> but this man's life has changed around. Maybe in the future, if he did stay as a jailer, maybe he was a, a nice jailer and a caring jailer. I don't know if that was possible under the Roman system, I don't know. <laughs> but this change made a difference to his life. And he knew the joy by opening up his life to Jesus and having that willingness to serve and care for those others. So I suppose the, the thing is, are we ready to open our lives and trust in Jesus explicitly, even if we don't know much about him, so we can be filled with joy and he can transform our lives too. And then this lovely story, perhaps one of the most pivotal stories in the Bible, especially for us as Gentiles in this part of the world, that suddenly the, this kind of story unfolds where Peter um, comes to realise that it's right for the Gentile people to hear about Jesus. And of course we read about this um, chap called Cornelius, a Roman centurion in Acts chapter 10. And of course he is a devout man, he's trying to follow God even though he is a Gentile. He is already listening and he's obeying God's message. And when this particular message comes along, but sent by the angel, he responds to it and he invites Peter over from Joppa to come to Caesarea to speak to him. And of course, all these things happen and other things happen as well. We start having some background story that I've not included there. And of course, poor Peter has to go through this battle with his prejudices and his religious background to speak about Jesus to Gentiles who were considered kind of unclean and you shouldn't spend time with Gentiles and etc. Of course Peter has that lovely dream but following that dream of confirmation Peter is willing to obey and shares with Cornelius his family and his kind of guests who are there about the good news of Jesus and of course Cornelius is ready to listen. 
and he's willing to accept the message. And of course, whilst he already had a relationship with God based on the old Jewish traditions, he already knows, he calls him Lord already when he sees the angel. He's, he's willing to call God Lord. He's already made him God the first place. Because obviously as a Roman, that wouldn't be the normal course of things. But he's already accepted that God of the Jews is the, is the true God. But now he is ready to accept the full message of salvation through Jesus. And of course, extra blessings come from that. God wants him to have these extra things, to have a full experience. And he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to be baptised with his household. And of course, Peter goes through this journey of enlightenment that Jesus is for all people, not just for the Jews. And whilst obeying God, whilst he might have been a little taken back and surprised when Cornelius and his friends are filled with the Holy Spirit, just as the Jewish believers had been, but he comes to accept, and he accepts that with an open heart, all his prejudice behind him, and he welcomes them into the church of Jesus by baptising them and welcoming them in. So are we ready to listen to God's voice and maybe we perhaps have extra blessings that God has for us when we open ourselves more to him. Just like Cornelius went that extra step. He could have said, well, I'm quite happy just being a devout Jewish follower. But no, he was willing to hear God speak to him and to move on. And he didn't just want to have that second type of relationship with God. He wanted a closer relationship through the Lord Jesus. And I suppose like Peter, are we willing to listen to God, release our prejudices and let God have free reign in our lives? Because so often those stop things that God wants to do. I want to think about good old Zacchaeus and because he was a tax collector he was a traitor to his own nation he was a hated and he was an outcast in in Jericho and everyone avoided him if they could and for good reason they did not trust him I'm sure there were many other nicer people who could have had a meal with in Jericho but we all know that Jesus did not come to save the righteous people, but he came for sinners. Jesus was not worried about the muttering and condemnation from the other townsfolk about him spending time with a sinner. No, he had an open heart and wanted to spend time with Zacchaeus that day. Something that morning stirred Zacchaeus to go down to the road just to have a look at Jesus as he passed by. And we can imagine the situation as the nice town folk of Jericho jostling for position to see Jesus themselves took great delight in pushing Zacchaeus to the back so he couldn't see anything. However, as we know, Zacchaeus did not miss out. So he climbs a tree and he has a good look at Jesus. And I, I suspect never in a million years did he expect Jesus going to stop and speak to him and invite himself for tea and for an overnight stay. I mean, what a shock it must have been for poor old Zacchaeus. But he responds immediately and welcomes Jesus gladly. If we look at the, the story as it's written, it appears Zacchaeus immediately wants to put things right. We don't know if anything was said to, by Jesus before this, or whether Jesus preached to him about repenting. But Zacchaeus was certainly ready to repent. And he was determined to completely change his life around by declaring his intentions to give generously to the poor and trying to restore justice by returning more than he stole from those people unlawfully. Again, I wonder if he stayed as a tax collector <coughs> after this 
uh, or whether he changed his career, I don't know. We don't know. But after this event, I bet if he had stayed as a tax collector, it would have been a good place to pay your taxes in Judea. It would have been the best place, because at least Zacchaeus would have been fair going into the future, because his heart was changed. And he welcomed Jesus into his life. And what a difference it makes. And I wonder how, again, we don't really kind of read about it, but wonder what happened to the people. Did the people start to, was it, there must have still been people who were kind of not a bit kind of untrustworthy towards Zacchaeus, but there are probably other people who had their lives, kind of perhaps relationships were restored. And maybe Zacchaeus' life was much better going forward because he repented, he put things right. But the important thing was he welcomed Jesus. And what a difference that makes when we welcome Jesus into the centre of our lives. Zacchaeus could have quite easily gone away, you know, just had a look at Jesus, gone away with his old life. But he took the decision that he wanted to change when he met Jesus. So are we ready to welcome Jesus and to make the necessary changes in our own lives to demonstrate our own salvation? I want to finish with a couple of well-known verses which should encourage us to let God have us fully or at least have a bigger part in our lives. I love the illustration in the shack about Jesus wanting to be at the centre of our mobile with the Holy Spirit blowing through everything we do and are. Rather than just dividing off and prioritising and allocating some parts of our pyramid, are we willing to give God the whole part? I wonder what we're holding back this morning. In Romans 12, we read these words, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. In our lives we need to worship our God fully. We need to come empty handed, not holding on to anything. We need him to transform our sin, our greed, <coughs> our prejudices, our agendas, our hatreds, our stubbornness forgiveness and our awkwardness so that we can be transformed and understand what God's will is for us. We can trust him because he only wants the best for our lives, what is good, pleasing and at the centre of his perfect will for us. Why do we hold on to second best so often? And I want to have a final verse which is a blessing really so let's just pray as we pray this blessing on each other this morning for this reason we kneel before the father whom from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name we pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen us with power through his spirit in our inner beings so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. I pray that we, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all of God's holy people, to grasp how wide, long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. As we come to communion, to sing this song, Jesus be the centre, be my source, be my life.